talking about hostas today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Jeanne Klein. Um, I'm, I've been a Douglas County Master Gardener, um, I think since the class of 2016, uh, but I have been gardening for about uh, over 35 years uh, here in Lawrence, uh, Kansas, uh, because I have two huge pin oaks in my backyard. And so I came upon hostas as a wonderful uh, perennial idea for shade gardens. And then I got hooked and just started collecting them. So I think I am the hostaholic of Douglas County. So um, uh, I'm now a member of the American Hosta Society. Um, I attended the national conference. I don't know if you can see my t-shirt. It was a virtual conference in Kalamazoo and Grand Rapids, Michigan. I'm a Michigander from way back. And the theme was smitten in the mitten. And believe me, I am smitten by hostas. So it was, we had a wonderful time online and it was great. So I can talk about um, that as well. If anyone has questions uh, that they'd like to ask, I'm happy to answer them during this presentation. Feel free to post your uh, questions in the chat box and I'll get to them when I see them, okay? So thank you so much. I think we'll get started. if my slides will advance. I'm not getting them advancing. Why are they not advancing? Let me see. There's an, a reason why they're not advancing. There we go, here we go, okay. All right, okay, first of all, uh, hostas are not native to uh, the United States, okay? They all come from Eastern China, Japan, and Korea. They come in all different sizes, colors, etc. So they come in what's called minis, which are very little small ones that are great fun. Small, medium, large, and giant. And hybridizers are now working on extra giant. They're like shrubs, okay? Uh, leaf color colors come in green, blue, gold, and variegated. <clears throat> they can be uh, white, cream, or yellow centers or margins. Uh, the blues, this is a, a strong tip. The blues require full shade, okay? Otherwise they will burn in the sun. Greens and variegated hostas are best in part shade and the golds can handle four hours in part sun, but I don't recommend putting them in noonday sun because they could easily burn. So early morning sun, east side sun is best for the golds or uh, late afternoon, evening is good for the golds. <clears throat> the stems known as petioles or scapes can come in green and they're now making them in maroon or red. I'll talk about some of those uh, a little later. The flowers, uh, most are not fragrant, but some are. Uh, they bloom uh, in white, lavender, or purple, and they can bloom anytime between May and September. So the minis um, are great fun and they can be up to uh, eight inches high. Um, I happen to own Tiny Tears, which is great fun because I, I buy the, the, hot, the hostas based on names of something that reminds me of whatever. Uh, I had a Tiny Tears doll uh, back in the 1950s and 60s. And so I had to have Tiny Tears. Cookie Crumbs is another fun one. Uh, blue mouse ears um, started a huge trend on mouse hostas, and there's lots of people that have what they call their mice bed or their mouse bed, and they have all the different houses. So there's uh, mouses. So there's blue mouse, green mouse, church mouse, school mouse, mighty mouse. I can't, I can't remember all the mouses. There's a whole bunch of, of mice, okay? Then um, another favorite is curly fries. And uh, for the uh, 2021 uh, uh, national convention, they always give a prize out or uh, always give hostas out, may I ship you hostas, um, a hosta, uh, convention hosta. And the one they sent this year is called Silly String, which is another hosta, mini hosta. And it's similar to curly fries, but the, um, the leaves are even thinner than curly fries and they're all green. And it's blooming right now with beautiful purple flowers. I really, I really love it. So it's a fun one. This, uh, there's lots of small uh, uh, hostas as well. I happen to love a uh, twist of lime, uh, which is a, a small one that makes a great border plant. It multiplies rapidly um, and I use it quite a lot for borders. Uh, it also has a sport, a cousin called lemon lime, which does not have the green margin. Quilting bee is fun because I'm a quilter, so I had to have that. Blue jay, you know, if you like uh, blue jay birds are, are very fun, that's a good one. 
Uh, Golden Tiara is uh, one of my favorites. It's also a, a fast multiplier and there's a whole family of Tiara pastas and I think I have most of them. There's Amber Tiara, Diamond Tiara, Platinum Tiara, um, Grand Tiara. I can't remember all the rest. There's another one called Diamonds Are Forever which I found, which is related to the Tiara family. And if you look real closely, the um, leaves shimmer and glitter in the sunshine, uh, you know, in, in, through dappled shade, a dappled sun. And it's really delightful. So it's called Diamonds Are Forever. So I'm, I'm only giving you some highlights of some examples of these hostas because there's literally thousands of them. Some of the mediums, uh, since I'm a, um, a uh, former theater professor, um, of course, I had to have on stage, which is wonderful. Um, on stage comes up bright like that, as you see in the photograph, um, in the spring, and then it darkens to a darker green uh, with its margins uh, later uh, in the summer and fall. Halcyon is one of my favorite blue hostas. I think it's one of the best blues, um, and I have several of those. Um, I think they're, and they're very hardy. Um, we is a new one <laughs> that hasn't been uh, registered yet. Um, people are trying to convince the, uh, the, the hybridizer to please uh, register it formally with the American Hosta Society. But again, you just sometimes you just buy them for the names. And orange marmalade is another uh, interesting one. Um, as you can see, it's not exactly orange orange, but it's a brighter yellow that pops up, uh, uh, comes up in the spring. Um, and I just think that's a fun name as well. Then you have large ones. Uh, one of my favorite large ones is Guardian Angel, um, which uh, I think is delightful. And again, there are, um, there's also a hosta called Earth Angel. There's Blue Angel, which is all blue. Um, very large, very majestic, um, nice tall ones. Sagai is a, a very favorite uh, large uh, hosta. Um, as you can see, it's a vase shape and it always shows up on the American Hosta Society po uh, popularity poll. Um, it's one of uh, a lot of people's uh, favorites, like it a lot. And again, because I'm a theater prof, I had to buy Leading Lady, and she is leading. She's probably one of my most prized possessions, a beautiful, uh, majestic hosta with uh, green hosta with uh, yellow uh, leaves that have, or yellow margins that have a little bit of a ruffle to them. And Lemon Meringue is another one I have, um, which I think is unique. As you can see, it's, it's, uh, has what's called a glaucus leaf, uh, which means it's, it's um, a little uh, waxy, okay? Um, but this one is lemony and um, it's great fun. And uh, it's been hanging on for, uh, uh, with me for about 30 years, I think. And then there are the giants. And this got started with Empress Wu, as you can see how, how tall she is. And there are several, many, many more giant hostas uh, that hybridizers have been uh, creating. And I do not own the giants just because I have such a small backyard. I just, I can't, I don't have room for them. So, but there are lots of giants if you wanna go that large. Um, some, again, some hostas are uh, what's called sun tolerant, which means no more than four hours, but they can handle a little bit more sun. Some in, in substance is a classic. Um, it, it, this one looks green in the photo, but it's actually far more yellow and gold. Um, and it's a wonderful large hosta. I have, I think a couple of them in my yard that are just fantastic. Um, and they can grow to a size, like I say, like a, a short shrub, they're just phenomenal. Sun Power is another one that's uh, another large hosta that I think is really lovely. Um, I have one in my backyard and it does glow in the moonlight. Um, it's truly phenomenal. It, it has a bright gold color. Glory is another gold hosta. There's a series of, of glory sports. Uh, there's Paul's Glory, which is a variegated that's very popular. Um, Golden Edger is another um, uh, goldish one that I have. Uh, there's Golden Scepter. There's a whole bunch of, there's a Golden Tiara, I, I think I showed you earlier, which is, um, uh, it, it happens to be variegated, but it has a gold center to it. So lots and lots of sun tolerant, as long as they get, again, early morning sun or late afternoon, evening, okay? The ones with the most fragrant flowers, uh, these are some examples here. Fragrant bouquet is a very lovely uh, medium hosta with fragrant flowers. Stained glass is, is wonderful. It, it, um, those leaves have kind of a, a little sh uh, shimmer to them. Honey bells is another one, uh, very fragrant flowers. 
So sweet is a fabulous multiplier. Um, it multiplies a lot. I have several uh, bunches of it in different parts of my yard. And guacamole, of course, is uh, uh, happens to have uh, fragrant flowers as well. It's a large um, gold with a green uh, variegated margin, as you see there. Um, there's a lot of distinctive hostas. Obviously, the um, like I say, the uh, hybridizers have been uh, you know just creating all kinds of amazing hostas that just blow me away. Rob Mortko is uh, one of our local um, hybridizers. He lives in Olathe, Kansas, and he has now gone into, he's no longer selling hostas like he used to, but he's uh, working on hybridizing full time. And so he's creating various hosta varieties and then selling them to wholesalers, okay? So you have to get his hostas from, from um, uh, other uh, retailers. Um, but his classic is called Stitch in Time, which I thought was really interesting. As you can see, it, it has a pucker along the uh, green uh, center, which is very unique. Praying Hands is a lovely small hosta, as you can see why it's named. Uh, it's a tall vase uh, with curly uh, green um, hands at the top. Cinnamon sticks is one of the first tostas that came out that have the red stems, which I think is great. And there's others too that are, um, they've got many, many, many more uh, red stemmed hostas that are on the market now. And they're now leaning towards purple stems. And I mean purple. Um, I saw a, a hosta at the convention called Purple Haze which is a very large hosta, purple stems, and I mean purple, that in the purple extends into the base of the leaf a little bit. And it's just a glorious hosta, a very large one, but it's worth looking into. Spilt milk is another fun hosta. Um, unfortunately, I have not been able to make that grow in, in Lawrence, Kansas in my yard. I'm not sure why, but I know it's su successful for a lot of uh, other Northern gardeners. And another fun one uh, is Lakeside Paisley, Paisley print that I just bought a few years ago, a small one. Um, Lakeside has a whole long list of uh, various hostas uh, in different sizes and shapes and whatnot. And, um, and I really like this Paisley print one. And diamonds are forever, I already talked to you about. Um, again, you can't see it glistening in this particular photo, but, but it is a fun one. Uh, embroidery is another distinctive uh, Hosta that I haven't, it's on my wish list, but I haven't gotten it yet. Aphrodite has gorgeous double white flowers. That's on my list. Yellow polka dot bikini has a really fun, interesting uh, variegation, as you see there. Fire Island, um, red stems and yellow leaves, which is really distinctive. There's a bunch of, of hostas that, that do that, uh, other kinds of varieties. And white feather, um, I believe is the first white leafed hosta and you can see the green veins that pop out of that one. It's just beautiful. Um, I have a friend here in Lawrence who said that she uh, uh, tried growing white feather and it did not survive in Lawrence. So again, you have to be careful. Some of these want um, more uh, hot and humid uh, zones. Others want colder uh, northern zones uh, for growing. So it all depends. You just experiment. And Dawn's Early Light, I thought, is another pretty one on, the, on my wish list, uh, a gold with uh, ruffled uh, edges. So they're making lots and lots with all kinds of ruffled and curly edges that are just um, incredible. Uh, here's some of the newer sensations. First Blush, I just bought that one. Um, as you can see, it has the red stems that extend out into the leaf in the spring, uh, but then it all fades to uh, solid green uh, for the rest of the year. Um, Valley's Lemon Squash, I think, is another uh, interesting one, and you can see how ruffled those uh, yellow leaves are. They're just fantastic. Um, so this is a, a, an example of one of my beds in my yard from several years ago. Um, you can see Guardian Angel in front here. Um, and this is uh, guacamole, and uh, there's a Halcyon, Sun Powers back here, and several others. Um, and so, again, you can use them as specimens uh, to showcase a particular, uh, uh, you know, like an Empress Wu, for example, or a, a Sum and Substance, a large one, and then uh, have other uh, sh shorter ones uh, um, around it. Um, I like to group them uh, in shade beds all over the place. Um, I have several shade beds, as you can see. Um, in the back here and across, and I have more around this way, and I have more on my other side. 
Um, and I like to uh, mix all the colors, you know, mix the greens, the variegations, the different kinds of variegations, the blues. Um, and so I have quite a mixture uh, that I place in my beds um, all over the place. So it's kind of, it's your own design taste in terms of what you wanna do. Um, again, I mix them with all kinds of other um, shade loving flowers. So uh, you can uh, mix them with a still bees. Um, I've got, here's a red astilbe I have here and white astilbe, pinks, etc. cetera. Um, ladies mantle is another one. You can also use a Tyrellia. Um, and uh, let's see what else have I, oh, um, I think I tried phlox, uh, the, the perennial phlox uh, a little bit, um, cause there are some phlox that will grow in part shade. Um, so there's plenty of shade perennials to mix. Oh, and geraniums, hardy geraniums is another thing um, that you can do. Uh, again, this photo was taken a long time ago. This Japanese tree, uh, Japanese maple, I thought was going to stay small and it's now uh, about 20 feet high. <laughs> oh, well, they're real hostas. I love hostas because they're so easy to plant and transplant. Um, uh, they want good soil, ideally mixed with compost. So I usually add a layer of compost on top uh, to many beds um, each spring. Um, and with the pin oaks, um, I try and uh, chop those leaves up and uh, have lots of oak leaves uh, um, uh, around them as well every fall. Um, they can be planted under most trees. Do not try planting them around silver or red maples because those trees have shallow roots and whenever you water all the, the silver and red maples will take that moisture right away. They'll, take, they'll soak up the moisture and take it away from your hostas. So don't put them by um, silver or red maples. Um, avoid planting them over large tree roots, okay? So what some gardeners do um, is they uh, plant uh, their hostas in large black containers, and then they bury the container um, into the ground around the roots, okay? So that as the roots grow, the roots will try and grow around the container. And you want the container uh, probably, oh, I don't know, three to five inches above the ground so you can see where it is. Um, and uh, and, and that's one method of, of what can work. Um, they're easy to transplant. You can transplant them in the spring, the fall, even the summer if you want, but I prefer uh, uh, moving them in the spring. I call it moving day. And that's where I move uh, anything that's too large or too small. Um, some may have died. So then I have another place to you know, plant another hosta, et cetera. Um, they don't necessarily need to be divided. Um, it's totally up to you. I uh, tend not to divide my hostas because I want them to be uh, large clumps, um, but there are some that multiply quite quickly um, and I start running out of space. And so I happen to have a, a list of some hostas that I need to divide um, uh, if anyone's interested locally uh, who would like to uh, pick some of those up from me. Um, and they're also called the friendship plant because they are so easy to share with friends. Um, again, here's, the, here's a photo of the pots, okay, an example of planting hostas uh, in pots, all right, to, to try and uh, work around your, uh, like, pin oak uh, trees and, and other kinds of trees. Uh, you can mulch them. Uh, uh, they need to be mulched, okay, again, with chopped leaves. Um, I put them about, uh, uh, about one or two inches deep uh, around the center to reduce pests. You do have to look out for cutworms, though. I've, uh, I have different seasons. I've had cutworms, cutworm problems, um, which is another story. Um, and definitely um, uh, mulch them before winter, okay, because some of them might heave out of the ground if you don't have enough mulch on them. The big thing about hostas is they do need to be watered at least one inch each week from spring through fall and especially through droughts, okay? I lost a lot of hostas in the drought of, I think it was 2012, where they just could not survive no matter how much I watered. Um, and again, all the cultivars are different. Um, and we've been very fortunate to have lots of rain this past May. And we had another four inches, a surprise four inches just last Friday, which I thought was phenomenal. So I keep a water gauge out so I have a sense of, of when my hostas need uh, their next inch of water um, uh, over time. Um, it's up to you if you want to deadhead the spent stems. I like to uh, deadhead the stems and the dead leaves for aesthetic appearances. That's completely up to you. There are some hostaholics, believe it or not, who cut off the flowers because they 
only want to look at the leaves. And I think that's personally, I think that's a little drastic, but again, it's all up to your own aesthetic uh, preferences in terms of how you want your houses to look. Um, there's a lot of debate about uh, cleaning up the dead plants in the fall or spring, um, because there are, are a lot of pests like the, your slugs um, and other uh, kinds of uh, pests that love to eat hostas. Um, so it depends. Um, I, I usually leave my dead leaves um, on the hostas uh, in the fall um, so that they've got a little bit more winter protection um, because we've been having some frosts and freezes. And so I just wanna make sure they have enough cover uh, during the whole winter. Um, and then I wait until uh, spring warms up a lot more before I uh, clean them up, okay? So it's okay to leave those dead leaves on in the, in the winter, but it's, it's up to you. Um, so as I mentioned, freeze damage, yes. Um, as you can see in this photo, here's a hosta that is a goner, all right? So what happens, so what happened this year is that, um, well, because I'm a hostaholic and I value my hostas, I ran out and I covered all of my hosta beds three times with unbleached muslin. I sewed a whole bunch, lots of, uh, I bought 84 yards of muslin and sewed pieces together. So I now have a map of which muslin pieces go on which beds. I also used um, uh, uh, old bed sheets, old mattress covers. Um, you can also cover them with pots uh, upside down. So there's still some air coming up. Um, if you don't cover them, this is what happens, okay? That depending upon the cultivar, um, all of those, uh, most of those leaves will turn to mush. They are goners for the season, but the eyes, which is, which is the top, the very top part of the hosta that sits just below the ground, as the, that eye can still be viable and you will get, and, and for some hostas, uh, they, they will survive the freeze if they're uncovered. Um, and they may grow new leaves for the next season. Again, it depends on the cultivar. I had, I had one hosta, a little small uh, hosta called Blue Skies that did not survive. Um, and uh, it's on my list to repurchase again and, and protect it better. Um, I have a friend of mine, um, another master gardener who did not cover any of her hostas last spring and her, most of her hostas survived okay. Um, she has a lot of them underneath a bunch of trees. So the microclimate matters, right? So I think the trees help to, to um, uh, provide some cover uh, from the freeze. Um, and she also had some a little bit more out in the open. And she said they all turned to white mush and she just got, you know, moved to the, the white mush and then they had new green leaves. So again, that particular variety um, uh, survived for her and that was okay. So it's kind of up to you. Um, if, if there's hostas you don't mind losing, you can leave them uncovered during a freeze. But if you want to, if you love your hostas and you want to protect them, then you do want to cover them um, with, uh, again, bed sheets, uh, unbleached muslin, or pots, okay, are the best uh, um, ideas. Um, hail damage. Um, wouldn't you know, I was on the garden tour in 2009 and we had a hailstorm. Um, so there's the hail damage on my leading lady, which was very disappointing. But uh, you know, the neat thing about hostas is all those leaves will die for the season and then you'll get new leaves the next year. So it's, it's always a new season and, and that's what we deal with as gardeners. And then of course there are slugs. So here's examples of the kinds of, of damage that slugs will do, okay? Um, and again, you can put out uh, beer traps, uh, put some uh, uh, cheap beer in uh, low lying, uh, low um, tuna fish cans, for example, cat food cans. Um, and you attract the slugs into the can and they drown themselves. Um, there's also other products out there. There's one called Sluggo, I forget what else. I don't have a big um, slug problem, knock on wood, um, in my yard. So I don't use, I don't like to use chemical uh, products in my garden if I can help it. So um, it's up to you in terms of, I used to have slugs and I had um, raccoons that would come visit my yard and they took care of the slug problem for me. So. Um, it, again, it just depends on your yard um, and where you happen to live. Um, if you live out in the country, don't bother growing hostas unless you intend to put up a seven or eight foot deer fence, okay? Um, so some people do that. They have a deer fence and that keeps the deer out. Um, there is a new product I just learned about at the national convention called plant skied. And it was invented in... 
I think, I can't remember if it was Denmark or Germany or Sweden, maybe. Anyway, in Europe. And it's now available. Um, uh, and you can, and you have to find a local retailer. And I did find a local retailer in Lawrence. Um, and a woman who is using it in her, she has a, a lots of acres out in the country. And she swears by it. She says it has protected her hostess for several years. Um, and the, and her, her yard is not fenced. And she has deer that come through all the time. But it is a product that is made from the blood of slaughtered cattle from Missouri, believe it or not. And, um, and so the deer smell the blood of uh, an animal, okay, of, of, the, of the cattle, and they stay away from it. So it's basically a repellent, all right? Um, but it is more of an organic um, kind of a product that um, people really uh, like a lot. And if anyone's interested in learning more about it, um, you can look up that. I can send you a link to that product. I sent it to a few of the master gardeners um, who might be interested in that. Um, but otherwise, you're going to have deer uh, eat your hostess because they think it's it's one of their favorite foods, and they're going to enjoy it quite a bit. Okay. Um, again, there's lots of different cultivars. They come up at different times of the year. So some come up early in March. Some don't come up until later in May. Again, if you're going to have a freeze, if there's an early freeze uh, forecast, you need to cover them up with cloth or plastic con containers. Yes, squirrels will dig into your new plants. All right. I use cayenne pepper. Other people use other kinds of products, uh, deterrents, um, et cetera, for squirrels. Um, and yes, some I usually don't have rabbits eating the hosta leaves, but um, but rabbits are, have been known um, that they could chew on some new plants. So it just depends on what critters you have in your um, yard. Um, if the leaves look scorched, that that hosta is telling you that it needs less sun. Okay, so you need to move it move it. And it's very, very important to keep watering hostas through the fall. And when I say fall, I mean October or early November. Because what I found out from Rod, Rob Morco is if you don't water all the way through fall, as long as you can possibly water before, you know, freezing your, your garden hoses or what have you, um, that affects the growth for next spring. So especially when we have a dry winter where we don't get much snow, um, that means your, your hostas are starved for water and you want to try and, and give them as much water as possible in, the, in October, November to help them last through January and February and, and into March before we hopefully get some spring rains, okay? So it makes a big difference when you water your, your hostas uh, into October, November. And again, some, cultivar, some cultivars just might not survive at all. It might be that they died, that their eye was too close to the top and it got hit by the freeze and, and just killed it. Or um, again, severe droughts, okay? Do we have a question there? Yes, I can send, I'll, I'll put, rem, remind me at the end, I'm gonna put that link for the plant feed uh, into the chat, okay? At the end, so remind me to do that. Good, thanks, Didi. Um, Come on, move forward, move forward, move forward. It's freezing up on me, it's not moving forward. I do have more slides here and I don't know why it's moving forward. Okay, I don't know, let me see. I don't know how to make this happen. Any tips on how to make it happen? Nope, I don't know why it's not moving. Um, let me just go by my memory of, of what um, I think I, I remember from, from my tips here or ideas. Um, I have some resources. Um, again, I belong to the American Hosta Society. They have this fabulous uh, uh, web link. There's a, well, it's a separate web link that I have on one of my slides here, if I can make it move, um, called uh, Hosta Library. And when you go into that Hosta library, there are, it's a whole alphabet, okay? And if you're looking, if you wanna find a, a particular Hosta, the name of a Hosta, you can hit whatever alphabet, you know, like if you're looking for blue mouse ears, you hit B for blue mouse ears and it'll take you to, and then you click uh, blue mouse ears and it'll show you some photographs, okay? Of what blue mouse ears looks like and examples of its flowers and things like that, okay? Uh, which is a great thing. I'm using my arrows like crazy. I am using my arrows. I am, I'm hitting all of my arrows and my slides are not moving. So I'll just keep hitting. 
Um, another, I think you can, can you see me in the screen here or not? Um, because I was trying to, where's, I'm, tr I can't see, where was it? I'm, I'm trying to hear, uh, let's see, screen meeting. I'm, I can't find my, I can't find the spot where I uh, do the, the share. Um, well, here, pause share. Maybe I can try that. Um, I am trying. I have personally not grown hostas in pots, Trudy. Um, uh, again, I have the pin oaks. And, um, and, and for example, my lemon meringue looked like, um, oh, try escape and then try. Good idea. Try escape. Oops, pause, share. Let me try this again. Just to share, resume, share. Up oh, there we go. Here we go. Here we go. Aha. How's that? I think I got it to work here. In Word Parkway. Oh, whoops, no, it didn't. Gosh, darn you. There it is. Um, uh, Ward uh, Mead Park in Topeka is a fabulous botanical park. If you haven't been there before, look it up. And they have an entire bed of hostas where they mark all the hostas of the year. And there are other um, hostaholics out there who do the same thing where they'll have a bed of all the, because the hosta, uh, American hosta growers every year uh, decide what's the, the hosta of the year, right? And they've been doing that since 1996. So this is a really fun garden if you want to look for those and um, see what uh, what uh, uh, hostas, which hostas are of the year. This is a, a photograph of Rob Morco's a tissue cut culture lab that he had in his um, uh, Olathe home in the basement of his home. It's obviously much larger. Um, I saw uh, examples of other hybridizers uh, labs in their basements and whatnot at their homes uh, during the convention uh, virtually. And it's very, it's a, it's a whole other world, okay, that I'm not about to get into because you need gobs of space. So basically you have to collect seeds and, and you have to grow them in, in these, you know, um, conditions, you know, so that they get light. You can see these little itty bitty bitty tiny um, leaves coming up. And then which as they get larger, then you transplant them into larger, you know, uh, small pots and so forth. And then eventually you need enough land in your yard on your property to start a hosta bed outdoors and then mark them and, and keep records of everything. So you can see which of the hostas that you're trying to hybridize will uh, become stable and will actually turn out the way you want it. Um, because people are trying to get red stems, purple stems, they're trying to get particular kinds of variegations, they're trying to get particular kinds of ruffles, they want a particular size, they want, I mean, all sorts of things. So you have to see if the hosta is actually going to turn out the way you're, you're trying to, to uh, make it grow, and then is it going to last more than a year, okay? Because some of these hostas, yeah, it might look great for one year, but then the traits die away after two or three years. So you don't want to sell that particular hosta on the market, okay, because it's not going to be a stable hosta. So we were told at the convention that only 5% of all hostas that are hybridized get sold on the market, okay? So that's how much labor is involved in trying to hybridize hostas. Um, my first uh, hosta convention, I attended the Midwest in 2017. Um, it was um, in Lenexa, obviously before COVID, and they had this fabulous leaf show. Um, so everybody brings multiple leaves from all their different hostas, and then there's all kinds of different categories, right, for all the different um, kinds of hostas there are, and then there's this huge leaf show. And you can see all these leaves in little vials of water. And then there's, I think, three or four judges that go through all the leaves and they decide which ones are first, second, third place, et cetera, et cetera. And they make the awards. Um, so um, it's really fun. And obviously, uh, for the past two years, the National Hosta Society, and well, in all the regionals and, and, and areas, were not able to hold conventions. So uh, nobody's been able to do a leaf show um, over the past two years. So Everyone, like everyone else, is we're crossing fingers that maybe we can do a leaf show um, at uh, whatever the next in-person uh, convention may be, okay? But uh, you can see why we're hostaholics. Uh, and, and again, you can learn about all these new hybrids and, and various, you know, admire all the different leaves that uh, you don't know about. Um, so here's the resources, okay? So again, uh, AmericanHostaSociety.org. 
Uh, they have all kinds of awards. There's the annual popularity poll. Any member can uh, uh, submit their uh, favorite hostas for the popularity poll, and then they announce it in the journal. Um, there's the hosta journal, which comes out twice weekly, and I can't um, I don't think my screen is up, uh, so you can't see me holding a, a, an example of the Hosta Journal, but it is uh, eye candy for Hostaholics. It has um, uh, all these gorgeous photos of uh, all the different Hostas. There's different news columns. Uh, the hybridizers have columns that talk about the, you know, the hybrid projects they're working on. Sometimes there'll be an article on um, how a Hosta got its name. Um, or other varieties that are too close to it and they're trying to, you know, separate it. Um, you also get the, all the hybridizers you get um, uh, as part of your membership. You get who's hybridizing what for that year. Um, you also get a quarterly uh, newsletter by email, which is fun, that, that gives news and, and interesting articles in that. Um, the annual individual membership costs $30. Um, and you can also join for, I think, like three years or five years or I think, and then they also have lifetime uh, memberships um, as well. And there's the hostalibrary.org um, address, okay? Um, so you can find all the hostas um, out there um, by uh, their names, again, by the alphabet uh, number. So that's all I have. Uh, there's my email address. Um, if anyone would like to email me and uh, let me stop sharing and go back to chat and see if anybody else has additional questions. Um, okay, and while, while, I'm, while people are thinking about their questions or comments, I'm gonna go to another um, place that I know I have the, um, the plant skied uh, information and see if I can, um, see if I can remember where I put that. Oh wait, no, it's not there. It's, um, okay, I have to remember where I put it. Um, I think I put it in the, um, here it is. I'm going to, I'm going to try something else. I'll be right back. Um, any questions or comments anyone has? Um, you're welcome to uh, unmute yourself and ask a question if you like. I just found the web link for plant skied and I will put that in the chat right here. And again, if you go to that site, um, it's, it's a huge site and it, it covers all kinds of critters. And it will also, um, there's also a place where you can find uh, a retailer in your area, okay? Um, the thing that I think is interesting, again, this is uh, a European com uh, company, um, and they made the decision, a purposeful decision, that they would not um, sell through Amazon. So don't even bother. Uh, they made a company decision that they would only sell to independent wholesale or retail dealers, which I think is pretty neat. So go to that website. You can find everything you want to know about all the different products they sell. Um, they sell it in liquid, granules. Uh, I can't remember what else. There's, there's a whole, some of it, you know, you just spread it on, around the hosta uh, ring in, in the spring. I think the woman who was talking to us said that she sprinkles granules, I think five times a year maybe under her hostas, or maybe it was a combination that she used the granules just as the hostas are popping in the spring. And then she started, and then she reverted to spraying the leaves uh, during the rest of the year. I, I can't remember her um, stuff, but um, she also gave us a, a PDF uh, tip sheet. So if anyone wants her tip sheet, you can email me and I can send you her um, tip sheet on uh, using this product um, on hostas. Um, and, uh, and of course there's lots of other products to keep the critters at bay. Uh, whether they're animals or insects. Um, I think I mentioned uh, some time ago, I had uh, problems with um, cutworms. And what, oh here's, oh, here's another book I wanted to show you. Yes, speaking of. Okay, so there's another 
fabulous book. Uh, it's like an encyclopedia called the Hasta Handbook by Mark Zillis. Um, and it's a fabulous book that goes through all your hostas and all the sports. And in the back, he talks about other um, uh, pests or problems that may occur, okay? Um, so you can see the slug damage over here. And then there's another uh, fungal disease that I just saw on a couple of my hostas recently. Um, it is called folio nematodes. They're microscopic worms that feed on the leaf tissue and you spread the, and they happen by splashing water on top of the leaves. And, and that's one of my problems is that I have a sprinkler. I mean, I use sprinklers, I sprinkle on top which is not the best way of watering hostas, but it's my way because I, I don't spend the money on having an irrigation system like a lot of professional hosta growers do. Um, anyway, the eggs over winter and the crowns, the dried foliage. So, it, you know, again, it could have been from last year's debris. I don't know. Um, and you're supposed to uh, dig the plant out and isolate them, which I haven't done and destroy the uh, uh, infected plants. You can also try, um, and then you have to go through a whole process of, of disinfecting uh, or, or disinfecting them, okay? Um, black vine weevils, I think, are more uh, prevalent in the south states, as I understand, um, and cutworms. So what I found about cutworms, and it could have been rabbits too, I don't know, but basically they cut the leaf at the base. They cut the stem of the leaf at the base. And I just had all these leaves laying around in, uh, hosta leaves below the plants and I didn't know what um, um, what to do and I found out that cutworms only come out at midnight in the dawn hours and I was not about to go out there with a flashlight and try and find cutworms across a hundred hostas okay so I just let the cut, cutworms have fun. Uh, Trudy, you're asking which hostas are best for tough love gardeners. What? Tell me what you mean by tough love. Do you mean um, that you, that you're hard on plants? Is that what you mean? Or, um, do you want to unmute yourself and, 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 um, and el elaborate what you mean? You mean like the, the hardiest hostas? I plant hostas, but I'm not always real good about keeping them watered and yeah. So I'm looking for some that are a little bit tougher. Okay. Yeah, um, I know there's a hosta called Francie, which is in, usually it's the older hostas that are most that are the most hardy, right? They're the most long lasting. They've been, they're classics. They've been around forever. Um, Francie is uh, has a green uh, center and a white margin. A friend of mine had a row of those next to her house out in the country. She never watered them, and they came back every single year, and I was astounded. So again, it was based on rain. That's all they got was rain. Um, so Francie is one to look into. Um, and, you know, I guess I would say just stay away from the, the newer uh, varieties. Um, some of the other classics, Golden Tiara might be good because again, it multiplies like crazy. So you wouldn't be losing all that much if you did lose some, you know, and again, it's that smaller one. Um, let me think of who else is really classic. Um, Mildred Seaver might be another possibility. Um, uh, oh, I should, come on, I should. I mean, I have so many hostas, I'm just trying to think, because I have, Abby is a, a good one for me, A-B-B-Y. Um, she multiplies pretty quickly, and she's been a stalwart for me um, and hasn't died out. Summon substance, uh, again, that large gold one, that might be a possibility um, because I remember there's been years where it was way out in the back of the yard and I forgot it was there. And, and again, it could be that it was protected by a shrub and, and some other plants. So it, it's, all, it's all about your microclimates, as you know. Um, so it depends on, on you know, how much um, tree or shade or, or shrub cover they have around them, you know, at the base. Um, Oh, and oh, I know, um, uh, uh, Lancifolia, L-A-N-C-I-F-O-L-I-A. Lancifolia is just a plain green lanced leaf, multiplies like crazy, 
And I didn't get around to covering any of those in the freeze and they, and they were up against a fence and they all survived. Um, the other ones I forgot to cover, um, I have a circle around one of my trees, is uh, Blue Cadet, C-A-D-E-T. Um, and that one survived uh, when I forgot to cover it. And the one next to it is Golden Scepter, I think is the one I was using. They're both smalls. I wanted kind of a blue gold alternating circle around the tree. And uh, so, so uh, Golden Scepter survived also. Um, and, and didn't mind the freeze. So I, is it, I think that that might be a good start, you know, in terms of which varieties um, are hardier for us anyway than others. Any other questions or comments anyone would like to ask? Did I cover all the ones in the chat? I gave you the link. And folks, this will be recorded on the Master Gardener uh, YouTube channel. So um, uh, if folks uh, have to leave or, or didn't make it, they can watch it again. But I wanted to sh make sure it was uh, recorded so people have a go-to place on hostas um, to see what else is new. Um, I think I have, okay, when I did the garden tour in 2009, I did an inventory and I had 129 hostas, I think. And so some of those were duplicates. Like I say, I really like Hal Halcyon, the yellow, uh, or the, I mean the, the blue hosta. Um, and I, I, there's just some that I, you know, I think I have a couple of guacamoles and whatever. So, um, 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 so it just depends, you know. I, and so, and I haven't done an inventory since then. It's on my to-do list. So I plan on doing another inventory to, to find out, okay, which of the hostas that I used to have um, are long dead and gone. Um, and, um, and then, you know, do I have some holes that I can buy some more, you know, because we're all called hostaholics. Um, since we have, a, unless people have other comments or questions, I can fill in with some, a little more information about the virtual convention in Michigan. I was smitten by the mitten. Um, so it was all virtual. They had some guest speakers. Um, Rob Morco from Olathe was one of the speakers and he talked about hot trends in hostas. And I was busy writing down all the names of all the latest hostas that are coming out, but I'm not necessarily going to buy them because again, if it's a brand new Hosta, first of all, it's going to be a high price, okay? Some of them can go for $35 or $80, $100. I refuse to pay that price, okay? I'm not that fanatic. Um, and I wait until a hosta has been on the market for several years. Um, and I will buy, I think the most I'll pay for a hosta, that I'm willing, personally willing to pay for a hosta would be like $12, maybe $15. Um, but most hostas you can get for $5, $8, $10. Um, that's the price that I'm, I'm willing to pay for a hosta. And especially if you want to, if you, if you don't, um, if you don't want to lose a hosta, start with the, the cheaper ones. Okay. Which are the classics. They've been on the market for a long time and that's why they're selling for five or $8 and they're, they're fine. They're, they're wonderful plants. Um, uh, the other thing, um, oh, and then the other speaker, um, for the convention was Hans Hansen who is, uh, he, he learned from, he learned hostas from Mark Zillis, the guy who wrote this handbook, um, at a, um, uh, a nursery in Minnesota called Shady Oaks that is now out of business, because I used to buy, back in the early 90s, a lot of us bought um, hostas from Shady Oaks. Um, and he is now working for a, a company called Walter's Garden, which is in, it's, I think it's in either Kalamazoo or Grand Rapids, Michigan, I'm not sure which. And he hybrid, he continues to hybridize um, hostas as well as other kinds of plants. So he's the director of, like a development director in the sense of developing new plants. And as I recall, I think Walters is basically a wholesaler, but if you live in the area, you can buy plants from them, okay? And they just created a hosta garden uh, demonstration garden at their um, uh, lot uh, that they did uh, in preparation for the Kalamazoo convention, which of course didn't happen. But if you happen to be in Kalamazoo, Michigan, you can go to Walter's Gardens and, and look at their, um, their bed. 
Um, we have a shade uh, demonstration garden, uh, some of you know, in uh, at the um, at, at um, the fairgrounds. Um, and I've been trying to convince people that more of those trees uh, in the back need to be pruned up because that shade is, in my opinion, too dark for most of the hostas there, okay? And I think that's part of why those hostas are not as large as they could be or as developed as they could be. And um, they're built on a slope, which means whenever it rains, the rainwater drains down to the base of the slope onto the sidewalk and doesn't stay in long enough in the ground um, uh, for the hostages themselves. So um, uh, again, that's, it's, that's the shade garden at, at uh, the fairgrounds. Um, the other thing at the uh, Hosta convention, they had uh, uh, garden tours, of course, which we would have done in person if we'd been there. But what they did instead is they videotaped, they made videotapes of all the Hosta gardens, all the owners and, and somebody interviewing them. So a video camera followed a couple people around. Um, all of the gardens were these huge, large acres of beds of, uh, shall I say, upper class folks who had the money to live outside of the cities um, in some more you know, suburban or, or uh, uh, exurban uh, area where they had lots of land up against a forest, okay? And they had these, these gardens were extraordinary. It just blew me away in terms of the numbers of hosta beds. And what a lot of, with that much land, what a lot of people did was they would create a hosta bed and make it into a great big mound so that you put like a giant hosta on the top or a hosta like sagai that grows like a vase. Um, you put that at the top. So then you have, you can see the, the or, or the, the red uh, petiole uh, hostas, you put it high enough so you can see those red stems um, more at a, at a, not up eye level, but like waist level. Do you need, see what I mean? And then they have smaller hostas coming off the, the berm as well. But I thought that was a great idea to show off um, all the different kinds of hostas uh, and their characteristics the best. I thought it was wonderful. They also hired someone to do a drone. And so they sent the drone up and then you got an air view of the entire um, property of these hosta owners, which was really uh, amazing. And you could see how all the beds were laid out and, um, and the extensiveness of, of some of these gardens. It was, it was truly phenomenal, it was great fun. Um, and so again, 10 tours, um, and I guess they're gonna leave them up, leave the videos up for um, the convention registrants through December so we can go back and look again. And so of course I took notes on them all and, and wrote down, you know, favorite hostas and, and hostas for a wish list and small ones, you know, that I can fit in my yard. And um, they also had, um, uh, well, again, just examples. Of, and Oh, and then some, some folks, of course, were growing the same hostas that I do. So I got to see examples of, of hostas that do better than mine uh, because they, you know, have, have um, uh, daily attention, right? They, a lot of these people had irrigation water systems underground so they can just turn on a switch and uh, put it on a timer. And these hostas are well watered and well, well cared for and well, well loved, well loved. Um, and they also uh, had the, um, they call it hospitality sessions in the evening because this is a very uh, social group of, of men and women who love to socialize and, and uh, tell jokes and whatnot. So um, I went, those were virtual. So I went to those every evening and uh, uh, it, it, people had, you know, at Zoom meetings and stuff. And then they had breakout rooms. So you could go to like, there was, I went to the one on small hostas um, and so people could talk about the small hostas or other people, there was a hybridizers uh, breakout room and several others, et cetera. And people could move around to different rooms. And so I learned more that way. They also had a bunch of workshops. Um, so some of the workshops, again, were pushing uh, particular products like the plant skied. Um, so that was one of them I caught. Um, and, uh, you know, and again, workshops by, by various uh, um, uh, like presidents, vice presidents of both the national and the regional um, hosta societies. And uh, let's see, what else can I tell you about the convention? So obviously I didn't take any photos because I it was all virtual. I didn't take photos of the screenshots. Um, let's see, the drones, the... And then, like I say, we got a t-shirt. You could order t-shirts um, and other 
paraphernalia, um, and we all got silly string <laughs> pasta, which was great. It's just a little mini with little curly green. Um, I wish I could just open up my back here. This is where I keep my um, my mini bed, mini and small hosta bed, uh, close uh, by the window. But it, it you can't see it very well through the with the sun with the sh sh uh, light shining through. So unfortunately, I can't do that. So I'm just chattering here um, as a hosta holic fan and uh, uh, waiting to see if there's any other questions or comments that I could talk about. Again, I am very, I, I am planning on dividing some hostas. I do have some extras. So if people are looking for, um, if you don't care what the variety is or what the size is, um, if you just email me and let me know, um, we could set up a time to, uh, for you to just come on over and um, I can dig up some uh, hostas for you, some, some divisions and put, uh, put them in a plastic bag for you. You can bring some plastic bags over and I'd be happy to share them because they're friendship plants and you're all my friends. So um, we can easily do that. Otherwise, I think what I may do is uh, 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 put, uh, uh, donate some to the Habitat for Humanity program that Sharon has uh, set up in September. Um, so get your hostas while they're hot. <laughs> Any other comments, questions, thoughts? You are so welcome. You are all welcome. I, I can't thank you enough for coming. I really appreciate having company. Um, and it's been, uh, it's been lovely. Uh, uh, as you can tell, I have a passion for hostas and I love talking about them and sharing information. So if you think of any questions later, just feel free to email or call me and, uh, and let me know again, if you want any uh, hosta divisions from my yard, you can you're welcome to come tour and uh, um, and kind of pick out whichever ones you're in, you might be interested in that uh, that I can share. Okay, so you're all very very welcome and thank you for coming and I'll see you next time at some other venue. Take care, everyone. Bye bye now.